know, every gay person has parents, um, and you would think that that would be enough to, you know, for people to see beyond their own families, but apparently not. Um, but medical marijuana is sort of the same thing. Everyone, or a lot of people are against it until a member of their family needs it. Uh, and then suddenly they see the wisdom of it. Um, and so, but to me, it's like how you can be against people getting the medicine they need when they're sick is just boggles the mind. And when I talk to people, they're like, well, it's, you know, it's dangerous. Unlike Oxycontin, for example, uh, you know, many other drugs that are much more addictive and have many more side effects than marijuana, which we give people routinely. Or I get, you know, well, people are, people are, you know, people are going to say they're sick, but they're really going to use it to get stoned. Because, you know, when you have, uh, you know, stage four cancer, getting stoned is your top priority, I guess. And, you know, it's, and even if it was, who cares? You know? So, that was a no-brainer. And as I sort of thought about the issue and talked it over with my staff, I thought, we're not doing what we really want to do. What we really want to do, because we, do we think it only should be for medical purposes, or do we think that prohibition is right under any circumstances? And, uh, you know, there's a lot of internal discussion and debate. It's like, don't you think it's not enough harm to get your political career? I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I was like, you know, we, 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 I said, let's do what we always do, which is get the facts, learn things, and, and be ready to, to defend this position. Uh, when uh, the time comes. But we made the decision to do it in part because after what was happening in Washington and Colorado, you know, they would always say, you know, six other states are considering legalization. And I'm like, and Pennsylvania was never one of those states. And I'm like, well, I can change that. I mean, you know, you just introduce a bill and then we're going to get something done. Um, so, uh, if we accomplish nothing else, we can do that. So, um, you know, we, uh, we, we decided to roll it out around Christmas time, uh, sort of as a present to the state, um, and uh, to my male sort of. So anyway, we, 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 we got ready to roll it out. And, and we, we just started talk, you know, talking about it in broad terms. I mean, keep in mind, prohibition, I'm sure all of you know this, prohibition is a policy that was instituted about 75 years ago. It has nothing to do with health. It has to do with economic competition. Uh, for, for pharmaceutical industries, because unlike, you know, most drugs, you got to do stuff to make them drugs, okay? you got to process them. That's where my, you know, uh, pharmaceutical companies make their money. When you can just pick something and smoke it, that's not, there's no money to be made in that for the pharmaceutical industry. They weren't happy about that. Marijuana was one of the most prescribed drugs in the nation in the 30s. Uh, but, but that was, you know, so that was number one. Um, and the other issue was, uh, you know, competition in terms of hemp, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, other manufacturers that competed with that. So it was it was demonized. It was right after prohibition on alcohol. There was an opportunistic situation where people could, you know, uh, demonize and intoxicate. Am I doing something wrong? Much better. Okay. Now. Um, <laughs> so uh, you know, we not revisited this policy in in 75 years. And in the, in the meantime, it has become a horribly cruel and pernicious and irrational policy. We would never, and I, when I debate someone, I've never, you know, well, I'll go through what people say, but, but we would never, given the situation, given, starting from scratch and comparing alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana, and saying these are three substances, which one are we going to make illegal, which ones are we going to, you know, actually sell in Pennsylvania? Are you, you're not all from Pennsylvania, right? Uh, okay. So you, if we sell alcohol in Pennsylvania, or that's a business that Pennsylvania is in, all right, we do that. So uh, which we would never have the situation we have now, because as you all know, alcohol, anything bad you can say about marijuana, you can say far worse about alcohol. There is, you know, alcohol is far more addictive. There is a lethal dose to alcohol. There is no lethal dose uh, to marijuana. You can try to smoke yourself to death, but you can't do it. I know many people who try. <laughs> Different, but um, <laughs> so you know, plus now, and just all the ancillary problems with it. 
there are the, you know, the fact that we make people go to, uh, you know, basically criminals behind the bowling alley to buy marijuana that they don't know the potency of, they don't know the place of something else, they don't know the safety of. And they're forced to be, you know, behind the bowling alley in the dark. And I got a letter from the bowling alley. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, it's just a metaphor, okay? Uh, but, but, you know, whereas if you want to buy booze, you walk into a well-lit store in the strip mall uh, where it's totally safe. You buy a bottle of Grey Goose, you know what you're getting, you know the potency, you know it's safe. All right? Um, so all, all of these things um, are, 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 you know, obvious reasons that prohibition is made. Not to mention, the lives it's destroying. I gotta tell you, and I'll, I'll get a little of the reaction I get. This blinking thing is going to come back here. You all can hear me, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, the, the, uh, you know, in Pennsylvania, we arrest 25,000 people a year, approximately, for marijuana. We spend about $350 million a year prosecuting them. And we leave several hundred million more, depending on how you tax it, on the table that we could be using for school and everything like that. In Pennsylvania, in the last year, we cut off all cash assistance to poor people, 100 percent, eliminated. Um, we cut, we eliminated the program of which, which gave uh, low-income people opportunities who didn't qualify for Medicaid opportunities to get health insurance. We've done a whole lot of really, we cut 800 million from our school, okay? And when we had a school district that couldn't pay the teachers, and actually the only time I ever met with the governor, he was the only time he ever met with me uh, personally, um, he said, yeah, I'm like. The guy gives some money to the school. He said, I wish I had money. I have no money. There's no money to be found anywhere. Gosh, where can we find money? Of course, a week later, he found 11 million for voter ID. Okay, so putting that aside. All right. All right. Well, I mean, you know, disenfranchising people is important. We have to prioritize. But no money. Here's hundreds of millions of dollars for you, Governor. Uh, you yeah, know, and, and, and no interest bill. So, um, you know, it, 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 the, the argument is so compelling. Uh, so we introduced the bill, and it was very interesting because, again, I've introduced a lot of controversial bills over the years. Often, they break down along parties of the line, the opposition. It's predictably, you know, conservative Republicans don't like my legislation, all right? Uh, often. Uh, this was very different, and, and it's been a, a, an amazing thing, because um, it doesn't break down along those lines. Uh, I've had very, very conservative legislators come up to me and say, where I'm 100% behind you. I can't say that publicly. Don't walk me. But I'm 100% behind you, okay? I had one conservative senator, I won't mention the person's name, but people have me who know the Senate would be shocked to hear it, say to me, I wish your bill was passed. That means I could smoke it on my porch instead of my living room. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, you did hear about the big prohibition legislator who was busted in the class. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Which, which suggests the lack of 
courage on the part of legislators. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and and you know, when mm -hmm. I say courage, just let me say, I don't really mean courage because, I mean, you know, courage is based on rational fear. And many of these people, there is no rational fear for, for their unwillingness to say what they support. Okay? I, I mean, because of gerrymandering in, in, in Pennsylvania, because of incumbent protection, there, most members of the House and Senate, particularly the Senate, in the Senate, one person has lost a general election. One se incumbent senator has lost a general election last week. Once. Okay? And that is because uh, it was, the district was moving just ideologically very much against them. But, I mean, no one's ever, I mean, no one's ever lost, it's been decades since the lost for something they've been dead. All right? Most of these people couldn't lose if they were indicted for treason. All right? <laughs> 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 this you understand. But yet they're terrified, okay? And so I've been trying to explore what it, what it is about marijuana that you can't, like, what, what is the, because really, it, 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 it's not the sort of issue that structurally should cause people to have this much fear. It's not a tax increase, which, you know, people are concerned about supporting because it takes money out of people's pockets and Things like that. This doesn't affect people at all unless they want to be affected by it. All right. Uh, that sort of thing structurally should not cause people to have that much fear. What is it? And I, I, I'd love to hear people's thoughts. I'll give you my thoughts, which is that marijuana has become tied into the culture wars. And that happens largely in the 60s. And so when people think of marijuana smokers now, people, when I say people, I mean, you know, uh, the, the, the sort of rigid conservatives who oppose what I'm doing, uh, when they think of that, they, they, they think of a person who looks like Jimi Hendrix, you know, um, smoking weed and burning the American flag and being against the war and being for abortion and, and other stuff. You know, like they have this, this image in their mind, okay? Um, and I, as, as I said, the average marijuana smoker now is less likely to look like Jimi Hendrix and more likely to look like Dick Cheney. Okay? <laughs> Middle age, you know, the person comes home after work, wants to take the edge off a little bit instead of a cocktail, he has a joint. So, um, one of the things you have to do, I think, over time, what all, all of us have to do, what our task is, is to sort of decouple this image of marijuana, the, the actual merits of the discussion of marijuana legalization from the sort of knee-jerk, visceral, reptilian brain, um, you know, uh, mm -hmm. image that people have of it in certain parts of the country and in certain age groups. I think that's a real problem. What do people say to me when we debate this issue? Uh, the big thing I always get, and this is just, uh, uh, this just drives me crazy, because, you know, there's, I, when, you do, when you deal with an argument long enough, you start understanding the physics of the argument, and so you, you sort of, you know, or know all angles of and all aspects of it. And so I think I understand the physics of this issue pretty well. And and so there's a few and there's a few arguments that drive me crazy because they just you know on so many levels are faulty. The, the most common can we guess what the most common argument is I guess? Well no no I'll get to the kids. Yeah that's that's another thing. Terrorism. Kids is number two. Number one is gateway drug. It's a gateway drug. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Now let's talk just briefly and then no. People can talk about what I'm talking about. Uh, let's talk briefly about how messed up I'm trying to not use the same language. Uh, <laughs> yes, that, that, <laughs> argument, that, that argument is. All right? First of all, what does that even mean? What does it mean? Does it mean if I smoke marijuana, I will instantly, like, give me heroin? Where is heroin? I guess, you know, or is it because, because that, that's interesting. All right? It, or is it because is this theory that I'll smoke marijuana, but because I'm buying marijuana from a criminal in a, in a different element, that I'm going to be exposed to heroin or other things. Well, I mean, if that's your theory, then you should be against prohibition. Because, again, you know, no one, when I go to the state store and buy my bottle of gray goose, the, the, it's very rare that the person behind the counter at the state store says, here you go, sir. By the way, I have some cocaine, too, if you're interested. All right? That doesn't really happen, does it? But if I'm buying it, you know, again, behind the proverbial bowling alley, that could happen. So if you believe that's the theory, um, then, then, and then how would you even measure that? Would you measure it that people who smoke marijuana are more, li are more likely, or, or people who use heroin are, are, 
have used marijuana in the past. Is that how you measure whether it's a gateway drug? Or whether or not people who use marijuana are more likely to use? Is, is the reverse of the same thing? I hope I'm articulating. Well, all right, so let me, let me tell you what the study says. There's a recent study from the at Yale, you may know it, and it's consistent with other studies, that they took a bunch of people who used meth and heroin and murder drugs, and they asked them, have you smoked marijuana? 34% of them said they had smoked marijuana, okay? And so, I was on a TV show once and said, some point in the study said, aha, not having read the whole study first, they said, aha, 30, that's true, 34% of them have used marijuana before. Now, I pointed out, and you've all, I'm sure heard this, that 100% of them had drank milk before, okay? <laughs> so, whether there is a, because there is a, you know, a, a time uh, uh, sequence, there's a causation, that isn't at all proven, but, but what the study also says is, putting milk aside, 34% have smoked marijuana, 56% have smoked cigarettes, and 57% have drank alcohol. So if marijuana is a gateway drug by that measure, it's a bad one, it's an ineffective one, and it's not nearly as good as products that are perfectly legal. <laughs> so if, if your argument is that, you, that it's a gateway drug, we should use, and if you should ban gateway drugs, we should reinstate prohibition. If you don't want to reinstate alcohol prohibition, and this is true almost every argument, then you have no argument for sustaining prohibition on marijuana. The other argument I get all the time is, uh, oh, by the way, the other side of that argument is, the overwhelming majority of people who smoke marijuana well into the 90s never use harder drugs. I never, I smoked marijuana when I was younger. Uh, I never, uh, I was a coward, I was, you know, I, I didn't use I, I never wanted to try any of uh, other than alcohol. Um, you know, with me. I don't think that's even, if I consider a harder drug, I don't know. But, but, um, I don't know. If you correct. No, I like it. But, so, that, so it is not, there is no statistical scientific evidence that it's a gateway drug at all. So that's number one. Number two is the children. And this is where people lose their ability to think critically. Um, uh, and, and, and at all. Because what we all, I guess, I guess, I can't tell you the emails I've gotten that are versions of this. <coughs> do you want, your children, yes, I do, have two children, uh, almost 10 and 12, okay? Um, do you want your children riding on a school bus with a driver who's stoned? No. <laughs> Uh, I also don't want my drive my my kid driving a bus with a driver who's drunk. Okay? Or a driver who's like hopped up on purpose then, okay? Or a driver who's lost other things, okay? Uh, but we don't ban those things. All right? What we do is we make it illegal to drive on alcohol. It is already illegal to drive on marijuana. The blood levels are my bill that I had ten years ago. Um, and so again there's the structure of that argument just doesn't sustain itself in the face of the fact that we have intoxicants which are worse and are legal. Okay? Um, and uh, then, of course, I just get the people who don't have an argument at all. They just lash out at me. You're just a stoner. <laughs> um, you know, I have, actually haven't smoked marijuana for a long, long time. Uh, you know, I, I'm trying to be healthy. And I think pouring hot gas over your lungs probably isn't a good idea. It doesn't help my running. Um, uh, you know, Sort of my, uh, well, the money range is helping my money, but I, <laughs> uh, you know, so I don't, you know, I, I, that's not why. This isn't about me getting access to pot, okay? <laughs> this is about the fact that we're destroying lives. I gotta tell you, I was at a judicial conference, but I won't name anything serious. But I was at a judicial conference in St. Martin. They always have such cool places, so I know. So, they, um, uh, there were four Supreme Court justices there, and were Republicans and Supreme Court justices. Came up to me again, 100% more. They agreed. I had many lower court judges just, who said to me, a couple of them told me stories, that there was a, you know, a kid sent to a great college that sold his body and joint, got caught. The college was really accepted. That kid's academic career is currently uh, sidetracked. All right? And there's people who can't get jobs because of these marijuana. Rates. There's people who are arrested, they're never even sent to jail for low grade offenses, but they serve jail time. Because they're arrested, they can't make bail or some probation violation or something a long time ago unrelated. So, um, 
you know, uh, the judge who actually deal with that, a lot of them are like, this is, you know, obviously. So what's the, what are the prospects for the future? Any, any questions anyone has? Um, uh, what I always say is for term is the best place, particularly the governor, who is not a deep thinker on this issue. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Governor Corbett, who decides he's doing any bills toward marijuana in it, essentially. You know, medical, you know, anything. I just, because it's a gate. I, no, he, he says this. It's even more than this. He says, he doesn't say it's a gateway drug. He says, I believe it's a gateway drug. <laughs> I mean, my kid believes in Santa Claus. <laughs> and you know, really, it's kind of embarrassing now because most kids are no longer believe in Santa Claus. But I thought it was cute like three years ago to hire some dude. Dress up as Santa Claus at like you know, one in the morning on Christmas Eve. I'm Jewish. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so um, they've actually seen Santa Claus. You see, so they now continue to believe well past when they appropriately should, and as a result, they're getting crappy down in the school. So that's the <laughs> but um, you know, people believe all kinds of. I mean, but it's just the fact that he would say on such an important issue. Not that I'm the former attorney general, and I've seen the studies, and I can tell you, there are no such studies. I believe it's a gay drug. Well, what do you do with that? I mean, you know, what do you do with subjective belief without evidence? I mean, actually, there's, there's nowhere to go with that. Um, uh, but anyway, he won't be there forever. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, we, there will be a new governor, perhaps sooner than later. So, uh, in the short term, this is a battle. Especially for the reasons we've talked about, because people are afraid. In the long term, it's inevitable. Why is it inevitable? Number one, demographics. Okay, as you know, young people, and I tell my conservative friends, I'm like, talk to, conserv talk to young conservatives, not liberals, talk to young conservatives, 25. They have no interest in prohibition. Okay? Uh, th this is a dead policy. It's a dead policy walk. Okay? Because every day, a supporter of prohibition, and the phone of the prohibition is born. Alright, so that over time that was um, number two is exposure. It's the same thing with Harris though. It's exposure. Because what happens is you paint these horrible stories about oh my god, there'll be there'll be all kinds of, you know, uh, uh, long hair stone clones like zombies running around the, the world that uh, we do this. Uh, and then California does what they've done, and Colorado and Washington do what they do. And people say, you know what? That didn't happen. It turns out that the uh, rate of illegal drug use did not go up, and the rate of drug addiction has actually gone down. It turns out they're saving hundreds of millions of dollars. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, and you look at the, uh, the, the, the examples of places where it's already been longer, like Portugal and other places in Europe. Where I mean, it's just life is so much better, you know. And they see that. And what's really going to drive this issue, frankly, is money. You know, 30, 40 years ago, there, there was only one place you could gamble in America because it was a big sin. You know, it was uh, Las Vegas, and that was it. Now there's gambling in 48 states. Okay, there's a casino a mile from my house. All right. So, uh, you know, over time, people are even conservative are going to be like, you know what? This is just too tempting to, you know, to carry on uh, with what we're doing. So this is inevitable in the long term. Uh, what I'm hoping to do is, this is inevitable, is bring closer the day that it happens. Because, frankly, uh, every day when this goes on is injustice. Every day that this goes on, lives are being destroyed. Uh, and so we're hoping to have hearings on this. Let everyone come in. Let all sides come in. Let them testify. And let, you know, let, let, let's really <coughs> scrutinize the reasons behind this. Um, so with that, uh, you know, please thank you for not only having me today, but for the fight you're waging. It's very important. People say to me sometimes, this is some kind of fringe issue, or why, are, why is this our top priority? And first of all, it's not my, obviously, my only issue. But it's not a fringe issue. It's an issue that involves tens of thousands of lives every year. It's an issue that involves billions of dollars every year. Uh, and, and, and it's just, you know, it's something that, that, that has to stop if we're going to ever progress as a society as we should. Uh, with that, I'm happy to take any questions at all. All right. Um, <laughs>